Um, I am speaking about advanced melanoma. So we've heard Dr. Wilder uh, talk about um, the diagnosis of melanoma and the management of early uh, stage melanoma. We've uh, heard uh, Dr. Prescott talk about um, a surgery for um, more advanced melanomas, and I'm gonna talk about um, the medical management of advanced melanomas. Um, <clears throat> so, melanoma is not as uncommon as we think. Um, about 80,000 cases a year diagnosed in this country, um, and this is one of the fastest growing uh, cancers that we have. Um, about 4% increase in the number of cases year over year, um, and uh, really, uh, making this time, particularly um, with, um, you know, our generation, previous generation, you know, not really having much knowledge about sun protection, um, as well as kind of the use of sun uh, tanning beds uh, in the 90s, 80s and 90s, uh, really seeing an epidemic of melanoma these days. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's still about 10,000 deaths per year. This is about a, a patient dying from melanoma uh, each hour. And... Um, uh, clearly, uh, this is unacceptable. Uh, we want this number to be zero. And so, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, prevention um, is really key. But what happens uh, when we're not able to prevent melanoma? So, as mentioned before, melanoma uh, comes from the cells called melanocytes. Uh, UV radiation uh, causes mutations in the blueprint of these cells, uh, which turns them into melanoma. And whenever we look at uh, the mutation pattern in melanomas, we see not only a mutation, but we see hundreds to thousands of mutations uh, in these uh, tumor cells, um, making it really the highest mutated cancer that we see um, amongst all other cancers. Um, this is really important uh, when we talk about the therapy of this uh, cancer, and which we'll touch on in a minute. So why is melanoma so dangerous? So um, these mutations uh, result in these cells behaving in a very aggressive way. They're able to grow fast. They're able to um, invade deep into the, the skin quickly. Um, and they're, uh, they gain the potential to break off uh, from the original tumor and spread. Um, so we, t we usually break down melanomas in terms of staging. So stage ones, and we've kind of hit on all these things in our previous talks. But just a reminder, stage ones, these are early, thin stage melanomas, can generally be treated with a simple uh, excision, uh, no lymph node biopsies needed. Uh, stage twos, uh, these are our um, uh, intermediate or thicker melanomas, um, and uh, these do need to have lymph node sampling, but we don't find out they're really stage two until we sample lymph nodes and find out that those are indeed negative. And stage three are these uh, patients that have uh, lymph node spread. Uh, stage four, uh, which I'm going to talk about in my uh, talk, is whenever what happens if the melanoma gets beyond the lymph nodes, gets internally, um, and that's what we call stage four melanoma. So uh, for prevention, uh, we haven't really had many drugs for prevention, and unfortunately, melanoma is a type of cancer um, that is not very sensitive to our traditional um, uh, cancer therapies. So chemotherapy, radiation, those things that we use in breast cancer and colon cancer and lung cancer, uh, don't work very well in melanoma. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that, um, but we haven't really had a good uh, preventive medication uh, for patients with a higher risk of melanoma. Uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, immune uh, drugs called interferons. Uh, interferon um, and pegylated interferon were FDA approved. And these drugs um, have the potential to delay the time to recurrence by about 10 months, uh, but haven't really uh, translated into cures or uh, preventing uh, uh, recurrences in the long term. Um, plus, they have a lot of potential side effects. And uh, there may be a patient or two that have experienced interferon in the audience, but by and large, we are getting away from these therapies. Um, in 2015, we had a drug called ipilimumab, and we'll talk about this drug in, in greater detail in a little while. But this um, um, is still only limited to some patients. Patients have to have at least a millimeter of melanoma involvement in a lymph node and have to have undergone the complete node dissection uh, in order to fit the FDA label for this. Um, however, this is a drug that has shown an improvement in long-term survival, and this story is still being written uh, as we get uh, results from uh, uh, patients who've been treated with your boy in a preventive fashion. Um, we know that at three years, uh, there's about 10% more uh, patients alive, but we suspect that's gonna grow 
um, to potentially as high as 20% um, as we follow these patients longer. Um, but unfortunately, again, this drug has a lot of potential for side effects. Uh, fatigue, diarrhea, rash, um, these are common side effects. And I know many of you are familiar with this drug and may have experienced some of these side effects. Um, and so we've certainly needed uh, better, we need better drugs. And I, I, I'm uh, glad to say that uh, there are promising drugs in, in preventive trials going on right now that may change this prevention landscape. So after we diagnose stage two or three melanoma, it's really important, as Dr. Prescott was highlighting, that we have very close uh, physician observation. Uh, we um, get intermittent PET scans or CT scans uh, to follow the patient. Um, we recommend dermatology follow-up for life. Um, and it's also, this is the uh, time to really talk about uh, what can we do to prevent more skin cancers in this patient and uh, also in the family. So what if, God forbid, there is a relapse? So um, if um, we have a relapse kind of in the same zip code that the melanoma started of or kind of a localized relapse, we'll often recommend surgery. Uh, perhaps then consider um, adding one of these prevention medications. Um, if, uh, unfortunately, it's spread internally, then um, and surgery is not an option, then we're looking at medications. So what are the medicine options for stage four melanoma? So we have really um, two new categories of treatments. Um, these are um, directed towards um, specific abnormal proteins in the cancer cell. We call these targeted therapies. And we also have new immune therapies. And immune therapies uh, you can think of as really um, you know, stimulating the immune system. And the immune system is actually what is uh, doing the anti-cancer intervention. We have chemotherapy. As I mentioned earlier, it doesn't really work very well. But chemotherapy, when, it, um, when we do use it, we're trying to interfere with the DNA replication in the cancer cell. And I think chemotherapy is a great place to start to see where we were um, uh, about seven, eight years ago um, and what uh, kind of advances we've seen. So before 2011, we only had two drugs FDA approved for stage four melanoma. One was uh, decarbazine chemotherapy. Uh, it was approved in the 1970s, um, had response rates. And what I mean by response rate is um, the likelihood of shrinkage. So if we treat 100 patients, about 10 to 20 of those would have shrinkage of their tumor. Um, only uh, uh, this shrinkage would only last for about four to six months, and the tumor would start growing again, despite continued use of decarbazine. And um, unfortunately, the trials never really showed that this drug um, improved long-term outcomes. And um, so this was the one chemotherapy we had. Uh, we had a drug called hydocinerleukin-2, um, or IL-2. Uh, this drug was approved in the early 90s um, because it could induce durable remissions in about 5% of patients. Um, and at this toxicity, um, that required um, patients to be treated in the intensive care unit. Um, and so if you imagine, you know, a therapy that you have to be in an intensive care unit for a week to 10 days, um, every other week, um, and you've got a 5% chance of durable benefit, it's not really, uh, you know, all that great of a description of a medication, is it? Um, but unfortunately, you know, this is what we had. Um, we had uh, you know, studies after study that failed improvement in long-term survival. Um, as chemotherapies uh, you know, uh, came out, they were tried in melanoma. Uh, response rates were you know, generally you know, met this 20% cap. You know, we couldn't really see shrinkage more than 20% of the time. And none of the studies uh, showed really any improvement in outcomes. And that's where we were. So what happened in 2011? Well, we had these two new classes of drugs. Uh, drugs that were able to target um, a specific mutation, uh, mutated protein in the cancer, um, and a new immune drug, uh, which was the first of a, a group of drugs um, representing a new class of immune therapy. These drugs did show improvement in the average survival for patients. They did show improved response rates, and they also showed improved palliative benefit, meaning if a patient was having symptoms from their cancer, they were more likely to have uh, um, some respite from those symptoms with these therapies. So molecularly targeted medicine. Uh, this is a cartoon meant to confuse you, okay? Because, um, you know, the, the 
uh, inner workings of a cell uh, is very complex. Um, and uh, we have a lot of uh, proteins that get activated at certain times when our cells need to grow and divide. Um, but most of the time, these uh, proteins are turned off. Okay, And this is really a complex network of checks and balances. You could think of our current bureaucratic system. It's a great example. Um, and, um, you know, the interesting thing is that whenever you have UV radiation, and you have hundreds to thousands of mutations, a lot of times those mutations really don't do much. They don't cause any abnormal function in the cell, per se, um, unless the UV radiation hits just the right point. Okay, And just the right point um, happens to be these proteins that are important for regulating growth, for regulating um, cell survival, when a cell's supposed to die, when it's, you know, if that gets messed up, then the cell, you know, tends to live longer. Um, if uh, the cell is supposed to stay in one spot and you hit the, the gene that makes it uh, more likely to um, migrate, then that can cause a metastatic cancer. And so, um, you know, as the genetic um, uh, underpinnings were really starting to be figured out in the last 15 years, um, in not only humans, but in cancers as well, um, the, um, there were some important common mutations that we were seeing in melanoma. Uh, and these, uh, this is a chart representing some of them. So in the very rare um, uncommon mutate, uh, mel melanomas, about 5% of the time we see melanomas that come up on the soles of the feet, the palms. Uh, this was what Dr. Minter and Dr. Wilder, Wilder were talking about. We can see more, a more likelihood of getting a mutation in a protein called KIT. In the very rare eye melanoma, uh, we can see um, uh, mutations in a growth protein called GNAQ, and there's another one called GNA11. In skin melanomas, the majority of the time we see melanoma uh, mutations in B, either BRAF or NRAS. Uh, we can also see these mutations commonly in sun-exposed melanomas. Okay, so this gave us targets in order to design drugs against. And this is kind of a pie chart. If we broke, broke out, um, um, you know, what drives, what are the genetic mutations that drive melanoma, we could really lump it um, into this pie chart where we have about half of melanoma tumors um, overexpressing a growth protein called BRAF, about 20% of melanoma is overexpressing a growth protein called NRAS, and then um, a very small amount with that, that KIT mutation, and then there's a whole host of other uh, drivers uh, that make up um, the remainder. So what is BRAF? So BRAF is normally turned off in our, um, in our cells, but whenever this mutation happens, this, the um, BRAF protein is activated. And you can think of it kind of like a, a chain of dominoes. You kind of click this one domino over and then it causes others to activate. And ultimately the signal gets progressed down through a protein called MEK, ERK, and then that signals the melanoma cell to grow and divide and spread. We see these mutations in higher frequencies in patients with intermittently sun exposed. These are kind of our weekend warriors that go out and get sunburns a couple of times a year. You're more likely to have a melanoma in um, a melanoma that has a BRAF mutation as opposed to kind of the farmer um, worker who's out, you know, getting sun exposed all through the year. Um, young, the younger you are, if you're female, if you're overweight, your increase of BRAF mutation goes up to all the way to 80%. Um, so we have a drug called a BRAF inhibitor that's able to go in, at, kind of capture this mutated BRAF protein and uh, um, inactivate it. And that's the way uh, this first breakthrough um, happened. Okay. So um, Zelbaraf um, was the first drug uh, which was FDA approved to um, uh, block this BRAF signal. Um, it did so in a phase three trial uh, where it doubled the average survival compared to decarbazine chemotherapy. So we have uh, one of the first drugs showing an improved term outcomes. Um, we saw that rapid responses were normal. Um, and this was something we were not used to seeing in melanoma. And I can tell you the first uh, time I gave a patient uh, Zalbaraf uh, was uh, in 2009. Uh, it was one of the very first patients we treated on a, um, a new clinical trial with the drug. Um, the patient came in with big bulky tumors. We could see them across the room. And um, after a week of being on therapy, she came back in for a visit. 
And this was a, a lady who loved to square dance. And um, she came in the first time in a wheelchair. She came in the second time walking in, couldn't see tumors, and she was back to square dancing. And um, it, this was just phenomenal. We were very ecstatic. Um, but that was, a, what come to find out, going to be a normal thing. And, um, and so this uh, drug has been shown to be um, uh, useful in patients who have had uh, prior therapy, uh, such as chemotherapies and IL-2, as well as patients that were naive. And common side effects that we see are fatigue, joint pain, rashes, sun sensitivity, so it can increase your risk for sunburns, um, and these other skin cancers called squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, or keratoacanthomas. Um, this is a PET scan, and um, all of these little black dots um, represent tumors, um, and these are uh, three different patients. Um, the one on the left being uh, the patient um, at the start of treatment, and then the one on the right image being um, patients after 15 tr uh, days of getting therapy. And you don't have to be a radiologist to see there's less black spot spots. And, um, if you can imagine these black spots causing pain and discomfort and weight loss and you know, really um, you know, affecting the patient's quality of life, um, you can imagine that patients not only looked better on scans but were feeling better as well, and that was the case. Um, unfortunately, though, um, patients did end up relapsing. And um, so we go back to our little cartoon, how can we um, um, you know, fix this problem if we're blocking BRAF um, there was actually some science looking at uh, patients who were progressing and were finding that the same pathway was getting activated just downstream. And so along came a drug uh, which, is, which, which was able to block um, MEK, um, which was uh, kind of that next domino in this cascade of dominoes that was really relevant to these patients' tumor. And so studies looking at combining both the BRAF inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor were done. And we had our first combination, um, tafinlar and mechanist, dibrafen and trametinib, uh, one drug blocking BRAF, the other drug blocking MEK, um, and we saw that um, this um, combination compared to uh, Zelbaraf um, doubled um, the effectiveness. Um, we also saw improved long-term um, outcomes with the patients, um, and this has really become a standard of care. And, um, you know, fortunately, you know, one nice thing about um, this center is we've been able to participate in these studies and kind of see this progress happening in patients um, and be able to get them cutting edge medicines before they're FDA approved. But now that we've seen, um, you know, dibrafenib and um, uh, uh demonstrate these long-term outcomes, uh, the makers of Zelbaraf also came along with a MEK inhibitor and demonstrated very similar results in their own trials. So now we have two different combinations for patients both the uh, tapenlar mechanist and Zelbaraf and Cotelic are FDA approved, um, but are very similar in the way they work and in their side effect profiles. Uh, so what if you don't have a BRAF mutation? Are there kind of genetic targets? And um, we believe there is um, you know, some role uh, for looking at um, uh, other genetic um, targets. Um, this has not been as straightforward as uh, targeting BRAF, unfortunately, uh, but we have had uh, patients um, who have NRAS mutations um, like I mentioned earlier, this occurs in about 20% of patients, um, and NRAS also signals through that MEK protein just like BRAF does, so uh, we don't have a good drug that blocks NRAS uh, just because of the nature of it. It's been hard to design a drug uh, against that, but blocking MEK um, um, appears to be effective, and we actually have a patient going to be on our panel today um, who can talk about this drug. Um, but, um, you know, this is something that may move forward um, uh, for patients soon. Um, I can tell you that um, there are um, some drugs that are going to go before the FDA very soon. Um, we may see our first MEK inhibitor approved for this disease uh, this year. Um, KIT um, has been an even more difficult because of the rarity of it. Um, you know, the tr clinical trials that have been done have been, you know, uh, about 20, 30 patients big, so not very big studies. Um, additionally, um, you know, uh, being able to block uh, this mutation appears to have some benefit, but not as great of a benefit as uh, blocking BRAF or NRAS per se. 
Uh, we have done some clinical studies. Um, so we have a stand up to cancer uh, trial that we've done here, um, looking at patients who don't have BRAF mutations and, and doing whole genome sequencing, trying to figure this out. So I think there's gonna be more to come in the future, um, but right now this is kind of where we stand with targeted therapy. Um, we also are looking at combining MEK inhibitors with immunotherapy drugs um, as well, and we'll get into immunotherapy in just a second, but trying to use a little bit of both in these patients that have uh, no BRAF mutation, and that also may be a way forward. So what about immune therapy? So this is a nice little um, a picture of a cancer cell being attacked by an immune cell called a cytotoxic T cell. Um, and I kind of imagine this happening in all my patients as we're treating them with therapy, but it'd be really nice to kind of uh, see this in action, wouldn't it? So this is ipilimumab. So ipilimumab, I mentioned, was the very first of these new class of drugs. And this is the way it works. So we have um, our immune cells um, called T cells. These are the cells that do um, uh, the job of fighting cancers. They also help us uh, fight viruses, uh, help us fight um, different um, uh, foreign invaders, uh, back, uh, certain bacteria, certain um, uh, other th uh, infectious agents. But um, our immune cells need to be activated in order to do their job. They need to recognize the enemy and they need to be able to um, mount an immune response to that. And unfortunately, um, even though we've known for many years that the immune cells are able to recognize melanoma, we often see immune cells invading in melanoma tumors when we biopsy them, there's something that has been a barrier to the immune cells actually making a meaningful response on their own. And um, this was really a pivotal finding um, uh, uh, where there are certain molecules on the surface of these um, immune cells that regulate their function. And I often use the analogy kind of like your coffee pot at home. Your coffee pot, you turn it on, you know, it does its job, but it automatically turns off, usually the more modern ones do, to kind of prevent, you know, uh, something bad from happening. And our immune system is wired the same way. They will be able to um, activate, um, but there are things that have to happen to keep them activated. Um, they have uh, these auto off switches uh, that can happen. And um, CTLA-4 uh, was one of the first uh, well-described off switches of immune cells. And what we were seeing was that the immune cells, the T cells were being activated, but shortly afterwards, usually within a day or two, the CTLA-4 off switch was also being activated. And so this activation wasn't really meaningful. And so the immune cell was just getting turned off, automatically turned off. What Yervoy does, ipilimumab, is that it's an antibody that moves in and uh, attaches to the off switch and causes it to um, not work. So the immune cell can remain active. And so you could think of it also, kind of like your car, in order to get your car to go from point A to point B, you have to turn it on, you have to use the steering wheel, push the accelerator, and um, re release the emergency brake. So this, really, uh, this drug really releases the brakes, um, but it's the immune cell's job to recognize melanoma and to be active. And we've known that in melanoma in particular, that process is already happening. So um, this is an IV therapy, it's an antibody, so it has to be given IV. Um, it's once every three weeks for four, four doses. Um, and it was shown in clinical studies that it can improve long-term survival. And we have now follow-up of patients uh, who have had your boy for 10 years. And we see about one out of five patients living, living long. Um, you know, either cured of cancer, where you don't see any tumors, or um, having tumors that just aren't growing for many, many years. Um, this treatment does not depend on whether the patient has a BRAF mutation, an NRAS mutation, KIP mutation. So far, you know, we haven't linked, um, you know, the mutational status of what mutations happen um, uh, with uh, response. But we do know that the more mutated a melanoma is, the more likely the immune uh, system may pick it up. And that does appear to at least have some uh, potential for being a marker of response. Um, common side effects we mentioned earlier, um, if the immune cell goes to the tumor, it shrinks tumor. If it goes um, other parts of the body, it can cause inflammation. And the two most common places we see inflammation are in the bowel, where we see diarrhea and uh, the skin where we can see rash or itching. Um, and these problems can be serious in some cases, and we have to use um, the antidote, which is steroids, anti-inflammatory medication to treat them. Uh, but this is, by and large, um, 
you know, a side effect that may happen um, and be treated and managed and resolved within weeks of, of, uh, of arising. So there are also some unique patterns of response we see with um, this uh, type of therapy. We're used to cancer, um, when we give a treatment, we see shrinkage. If it doesn't shrink, it's not working, we switch to something else. With immune therapy, particularly these new drugs, we've had to rethink this because while we can see um, that phenomenon where things will shrink right away, we oftentimes see this phenomenon where you know the tumor looks like it's getting worse. So this patient before starting, this is the liver over here, okay? And again, you don't have to be a radiologist to see with all these little black spots, that looks worse, more tumors. And this is after the four doses of Yervoy. And if we use our traditional way of thinking, we'd say this isn't working, we need to stop. Uh, but what really is happening is these immune cells are, you know, take some time to work. So during that time, you know, we can have true progression. But also in some uh, cases, we see the immune cells in infiltrating the tumor, causing the um, tumor to become more prominent on scans um, and then respond. And so in this patient, we see an initial progression followed by um, a reduction in the size of the tumor that lasts um, for a long time. Uh, this is another um, patient who has skin tumors. And we can see at the beginning, you know, the skin tumors um, start at this point. They look worse at 12 weeks. And then by week 14, they're improving. And then out of 108 weeks, there's no tumors, okay? Um, so again, that kind of pattern of um, progression or pseudo-progression early in the course of therapy. And then we can also see this phenomenon. This patient ha had only two doses of treatment, had to stop because of side effects. But you can see all of these uh, spots in the lungs. Uh, this is a CT scan of the chest. Um, and um, at five years, or um, you know, after a period of time, we see that they're reduced, but we still see some tumors. But this patient hasn't progressed um, more than five years later. And these are actually old slides. So this is patients probably in that group of eight to 10 years of follow-up. So ipilimumab, we see um, improved risk, uh, improvement in the risk of death. We see um, that this um, uh, is um, true in patients who are untreated as well as patients who've had previous treatment. Uh, we can see uh, the potential for long responses and complete responses, but there are uh, potential for side effects. Um, and that is uh, uh, something serious that we need to uh, be able to be cognizant of and deal with as appropriate. So next in our uh, kind of um, parade of immune therapies, we have uh, the PD-1 inhibitors. And just like CTLA-4 is an off switch, so is PD-1. Uh, PD-1, um, however, um, is expressed at a different point in time. So generally we think of as uh, CTLA-4 um, you know, uh, expression and action happening more early in the immune response. Remember I m mentioned in the first one to two days. It usually happens in the lymph node, which is kind of our uh, patrol station in our immune system uh, where things uh, are initiated. But PD-1 activity actually happens more in the tumor microenvironment, you know, in the tumor itself. So even when we block um, CTLA-4 with your boy, we still see progression in, in a large percentage of patients. Why is that? Um, well, because there are other potential barriers to normal immune function, and PD-1 is one of those. And so PD-1 um, um, actually can be expressed on the tumor itself. So this is uh, you know, one example of how the tumor can interact with the immune cell and shut off the immune cell, even in, um, when we're using your boy. Um, and so um, this kind of led um, uh, folks to um, be curious of potentially blocking this um, in melanoma if we can see responses. When we look about the, the, help, the percentage of this pdl one expression, this kind of, um, uh, you know, how often is this happening in melanoma that we can identify um, it's about 40 to 60 percent of the time, which is a pretty significant amount of time. We can also see it in other cancers, and we've now seen this class of drug be approved in other cancers, um, but it all started in melanoma. And so Keytruda in 2014 uh, was the first PE1 in, uh, inhibitor FDA approved, um, and it was uh, approved based on the ability to um, induce responses in patients who'd previously been treated with Yervoy uh, or ipilimumab and failed. Um, and 
Uh, it was subsequently shown to be superior to ipilimumab in trials uh, randomized, ra randomizing to one or the other in untreated uh, patients. Um, and it also, just like the uh, Yervoy, has similar um, types of side effects uh, because, again, we're us utilizing the immune system. But um, generally, these immune side effects are much less frequent um, than with Yervoy and much more tolerable, uh, which has um, really given this class of drugs um, a lot of buzz um, when they first came out. Uh, this was quickly followed just a few months later by the approval of nivolumab or Opdivo, uh, which had kind of a similar path of um, a clinical study um, being shown to be effective after uh, uh, patients in patients after they progressed on Yervoy in the frontline setting compared to chemotherapy and also in the frontline setting compared to Yervoy. Uh, patients often ask, you know, which one is better? And, um, you know, the, the honest answer is we don't know because they haven't been compared head to head in a trial and they never will be. But if we look at the different studies and we kind of compare how effective they are in terms of likelihood of shrinking tumors, how long that benefit's going to last, you know, how long are patients living, um, what the side effect profiles are, they look very, very similar. And, you know, they're antibodies designed against the same target just by different companies, so we would think so. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, I, I feel um, that they're um, somewhat interchangeable. So what about PD-1 therapy compared to Yervoy? So um, as I mentioned, you know, both of these drugs have now been um, uh, shown to be, um, um, uh, have better response rates, improvement in long-term survival compared to Yervoy. Uh, but we also see a much better toxicity profile. Um, less than 10% of patients on PD-1 and therapy have to stop because of side effects, um, where it's closer to 30 to 50%, depending uh, on what study we look at uh, with Yervoy. And um, so that kind of leads us with one of our last um, bits of information uh, on this topic, which is what if we combine them? We have two different targets. Uh, what if we use both antibodies together? And this is information from uh, the very first study that attempted to do this, um, and um, I tried not to put a lot of charts in, in, um, in this uh, thing because I think they can be kind of confusing, but I did put this one in because I, I, I love it. I think it uh, really speaks to, um, you know, the, the potential of this combination. On the chart on the left, we see um, a bunch of lines. We call this a, a, a spider plot. Um, and um, you, each one of these lines represents um, what um, a patient's tumor is doing over time. And so um, any uh, kind of deviations below zero means shrinkage. Anything above zero means it's growing. And then this is uh, on the x-axis, we have weeks of therapy. And so you can see that most patients have a dramatic drop in their tumor size. And um, one of the highlights of this combination has been how deeply patients respond, with most of these responses being more than 80% of shrink shrinkage of their tumors, with a lot of them getting to 100% <coughs> shrinkage. And in fact, we see about um, one in five patients um, have complete resolution of their tumors with this combination. Um, but we see other patterns of response too. Uh, we can see some patients um, uh, where they don't have complete shrinkage, but it's stable for a long time, or gradual response. We have other patients that you know, have a period of growth, kind of like we showed earlier, followed by response. And then we have some patients, unfortunately this is a small number and that's been kind of shown in, the, in our larger trials too, this is a very small study, um, that just don't respond to this therapy. Um, and we really need to figure out why so we can come up with better therapies for these patients. Um, but you can see that most patients are getting benefit um, from the spider plot. And this is a, another CT example of patient's tumor, all these little arrows point to tumors that have uh, resolved at 12 weeks. So this combination, um, again, uh, through a large trial, which we were fortunate to participate in um, here at the center and had a lot of patients uh, treated on this study. Uh, this combination was FDA approved in 2015, um, and it showed superior benefit compared to single drug PD-1 um, or your boy in terms of likelihood of shrinkage Okay, so there's a lot more patients having shrinkage of their tumor, a lot more patients having complete remission of their tumor with the combination. Uh, we also see that on average patients are benefiting longer compared to either drug along, alone. But unfortunately, again, when you combine drugs, not only do you have the potential for better efficacy, but you also have the potential for higher side effects. 
And um, in this uh, combination, we do have a higher side effect rate. And about half of patients have to stop therapy in the first three months because of side effects that come up. Um, we do have um, some potential um, for long-term survival updates coming soon, um, but um, I think that um, we are all very hopeful that this combination is going to uh, show um, improvement in long-term survival in patients on average, um, as well as potentially there might be a subset of patients um, that we're curing. Uh, but again, these drugs are very new and we need more time to follow, um, follow them. And that brings us to our kind of last drug that I'm going to talk about, which is Emlygic. Emlygic is uh, the newest addition um, in our um, armory to fight melanoma. And Emlygic is different than uh, any of the drugs we've talked about so far. Emlygic is actually a virus. Um, this is a virus um, that's um, um, based on a herpes simplex virus um, that's been particularly selected because of its potential to just infect melanomas uh, or cancerous cells, but doesn't infect normal cells. Um, whenever we talk about giving a patient a virus, uh, that's one of the first questions. Am I going to get this virus? Is it going to uh, you know, cause problems? And, and fortunately, this is not the case with this virus um, because of its selectivity. Uh, but the other th cool thing about a virus is um, that just like a computer virus, um, the biologists can actually put different coding in. Um, and in this um, vi particular virus, they put in a coding for an immune hormone. And so what happens is we have a tumor, um, and these tumors in this particular, with this particular treatment have to be tumors we can get at with a needle. So we're talking about patients with lymph nodes or patients with skin uh, uh, melanomas. Uh, we can't, you know, repeatedly inject tumors in the lung or liver and the uh, abdominal cavity. So we're really looking at a kind of a small um, uh, subset of patients here. But we inject the, this live virus into the tumor. Uh, the virus um, infects the uh, melanoma cells. Um, the, the virus reproduces in those melanoma cells to the point where the melanoma cell bursts because it can't handle any more virus. Um, it causes all kinds of dysfunction in the cell, so the cell just bursts. But while it's um, replicating in the cell, it's making this GMCSF immune hormone, okay, that kind of special uh, coding sequence that they put in the virus. So what's happening when the cell bursts, or the virus particles are released, and they can go on to infect other melanoma cells, um, and the immune hormone can wake up our sleeping immune cells and attract them to the tumor. And so we kind of get this two-pronged attack on the tumor where the virus is killing cells and we also are rec recruiting immune cells uh, to help with uh, the melanoma fighting. Um, and this um, uh, drug or virus or vaccine or however you want to label it has been FDA approved now based on a study um, that showed a durable response rate in patients um, and that was a significant finding, the first viral uh, ther therapy for us to, to, to see in uh, cancer treatment. Um, and now uh, the next steps are really looking at uh, trying to combine this virus um, with other immune therapies and other uh, treatments. Um, and that's kind of what oncologists do. We get effective therapies. We kind of try to mix, mix them up into uh, you know, just the right cocktail. And so that's really where we're at with the future of melanoma. Um, so we have a lot of uh, drugs um, that have been approved, a lot of drugs that are um, kind of different takes on the same, uh, you know, uh, targets and same, you know, uh, ideas, um, but to trying to kind of mix them together and find just the right uh, therapy that is not only um, most effective, but most tolerable and, you know, um, uh, gonna benefit the patient the greatest. So um, we have um, been participating in studies and, and have a lot of studies in our docket um, looking at um, different ways of modulating the immune system, um, uh, trying to combine um, kind of drugs like immune therapy, the, uh, uh, drugs like Keytruda with um, targeted drugs like BRAF blocking drugs. Um, there are uh, particularly studies going on trying to figure out what's the best sequence, you know, of these. Should we use immune therapy first or targeted therapy first? You know, when should we switch? All of these questions are being answered in trials. Um, and um, lastly, trying to figure out who, you know, is responding really well and why, who's not responding and why, 
um, that's really going to you know help us um, design better drugs um, that are uh, uh, really kind of geared towards those particular patient populations and, and improving outcomes. Um, this is another slide I put in um, uh, to confuse you because it certainly um, you know is you know just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the potential for immune therapy. These are all the different on and off switches on an, on an immune cell that we know of. That, that's just what we know of. And this is just one way we can modify um, the immune system to work for us. And so um, CTLA-4, or is it right there, is just one of these. PD-1 is just one of these. There are many others. And uh, we have a whole host of drugs, antibodies, that are designed against all of these different things and trying to figure out the right combination, the right uh, sequence, you know, all of these things. Who should we use them in is certainly a big undertaking uh, for the next 10 to 15 years. So clinical trials in melanoma. It's really important um, that we figure this stuff out. Uh, like I said at the beginning, we don't want anyone dying of this disease. Um, and this is going to be the answer. You know, figuring out, um, you know, what the best drugs are really require clinical trials. And that's something we're very um, strong on here. And uh, I know a lot of you have participated in clinical studies, and I thank you for doing that, um, because we've seen with tangible results over the last five years that benefit, not only for, for yourselves personally, but for others. Um, so melanoma is a common cancer, a serious cancer. It's preventable. Um, I would much rather all melanoma be prevented, and I fi find something else to do. But unfortunately, um, you know, we still have a lot of patients uh, coming down with advanced melanomas. Um, so um, it's important that those be managed correctly, that you're seeing dermatologists, that you're, you know, getting the surgical care you need. Um, and, then, and if you're uh, one of those patients that have um, developed advanced melanoma, that we're getting you uh, the best possible therapy and the potential uh, participation in clinical studies as well. So I'd like to thank our medical oncology melanoma team, uh, and that includes the patients. Um, like I said, without um, uh, patient participation, we wouldn't have new drugs and wouldn't have new advancements. And I know you guys know a lot of these people on this list, um, but I want to thank you uh, for you participating today. And we have uh, an important talk uh, coming up about patient survivorship, which is uh, a timely uh, discussion.